This video is about decision trees. We are given a dataset about Olympic athletes. The horizontal axis shows the height of the athletes, and the vertical axis shows their weight. Each dot represents an Olympic athlete. Each yellow dot is a weightlifter, and each orange dot is a volleyball player. You can see that the weightlifters and the volleyball players have quite a different physique, so it should be possible to train a classification model that can distinguish between weightlifters and volleyball players. Based on this data, what classifier would you suggest? Please pause the video and think about this for a second. We might separate weightlifters from ball players by separating them with this red line. If the combination of height and weight are below the red line, the athlete is a volleyballer, and if it is above, it is a weightlifter. However, note that not all athletes will be classified correctly. Along the red line, some weightlifters would be classified as ball players, and vice versa. Decision trees allow us to separate these points into regions using a set of decision rules based on the height and the weight of the athletes. However, decision trees usually do not allow arbitrary lines. Instead, they restrict themselves to orthogonal lines. In other words, they only consider one variable at a time. For instance, we might first say that athletes that are shorter are rather weightlifters. For the shorter athletes this is pretty accurate already, but for the taller athletes, further distinguishing according to weight will further improve our classification. So a decision tree partitions the space into multiple regions, each of which corresponds to one class, in our case either weightlifter or volleyball player. Let's see how we can obtain such a decision tree step by step. First, we consider one of the variables, in this case the height of the athletes. We see that most athletes below approximately 168 centimeters are weightlifters. This decision rule separates the space into two regions, one where the height is below 168 centimeters and one where the height is above 168 centimeters. This means that we effectively obtain two sets of points in each region. For taller athletes, our classification is not accurate yet. So we add a decision rule based on the weight of the athletes, with a threshold value of 82 kilograms. Based on these decision values, we obtain the three regions 1, 2, and 3. We can see that regions 1 and 3 correspond to the weightlifters whereas the volleyball players occupy region 2. However, this decision tree is not perfect. We can improve our classification by adding more decision rules, like this. Every additional line segment separates one region. In the decision tree this corresponds to splitting a leaf node into two children nodes. After adding some more nodes, our decision tree is quite accurate. Each region is now either predominantly yellow or orange, but there are still a few outliers. Of course, we could continue to split the areas which contain both weightlifters and volleyballers. Eventually however, we would probably overfit the training set. If we used our trained decision tree on the next generation of Olympians, our classifier might perform rather poorly. There are several natural ways to decide which region to split next. Popular algorithms try to find a region which has a lot of potential for a split. In particular we want that at least one of the two child regions becomes relatively clean, in the sense that we can assign a single class to that child node without too many classification errors. We now know how to use decision trees for classification. However, decision trees can also be used for regression. Please pause the video and think about how you would extend decision trees to regression problems for a second. For regression, we want to assign real values to each decision tree leaf. To train regression decision trees, we again need rules on how to split regions. A popular method is the so-called cart loss function. Intuitively, this loss function determines the squared distance between the values of the data samples in a decision tree node and the mean of that node. If we consider to split a node D into a left and a right child, we want both children to have a low loss. At the same time we want the split to be balanced, so that each child has roughly the same amount of data samples. Both of these goals can be achieved with this formula. Decision trees have a lot of building flexibility. We can train our tree only on a random subset of training data. Or we might choose our root variable randomly. 
each such decision will produce a slightly different decision tree. This way we can build several different decision trees for the same data set. Now we can combine these decision trees. The trees might not all agree on a given data sample. Some trees might classify a data sample as 2, whereas other trees would classify the same sample as 1 or 3. But we can simply decide on the output class that was suggested most often. In our example, most trees classify the input as 2, so it is natural the final output of the model is 2. Such ensembles of decision trees are called random forests, because each tree is random, and a bunch of trees is a forest. To summarize, decision trees provide a means to easily separate data based on recursively choosing a threshold value of one feature. We recursively cut the space into smaller regions until we have a good classification or regression model. Decision trees are particularly interesting because they can represent a learned function in a way which is easily readable by humans. Thanks for watching this video.